Good evening and welcome to the forum tonight. Um, my name is Adam Maestro, and I am currently the president of the ACS Board of Education. Uh, I have I've been a lifelong resident of District 1. I was born and raised and still live in the district. Um, I, mar I am married of, uh, to a husband that I've chosen to keep for about 43 years. <laughs> He's an amazing man, very supportive of all of my career goals. Um, I have four beautiful grown daughters, and I have eight beautiful grandchildren. Um, I have been an educator for 44 years, and I started in the classroom as an educational assistant. I've been a teacher, a classroom teacher, a Title I teacher, um, also a Title I coordinator, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent for APS, and also um, uh, vice president at YDI. I've also taught at the University of New Mexico, and I'm also a, a charter school founder and, and currently a director of a charter school. I am an active volunteer for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and um, also have been, as I said, on the board for one term, one year as the president this year, two years as the vice president, and one year as a member. Uh, I'm also on the board for the Council of Great City Schools. I'm very happy to be here tonight to answer your questions and hope that you get the word out, get everyone else to vote. It's a very important election. My name is Tavi Court, and I serve the Northwest area of the city, Volcano Vista High School, Cibola High School, and all the feeder schools. Um, I am a mom and a parent of four EPS students. Uh, my youngest is a fifth grader at Marine Hughes, and I've actually got three teenagers in high school right now. Lord help me. But I've got three kiddos in high school. Um, I have been a long time volunteer in our schools before I was asked by parents to represent them on the ADS Board of Education. This is my first term and I'm seeking a second uh, and hoping that I'll get the support of the community to do that. Um, I've got to tell you that um, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things. I'm proud of my husband and my children. My husband is a huge supporter of me and without going into any details, I can't tell you how much uh, because of the stances I've taken on behalf of students and teachers in this district. And yet I'm here today because he knows and I know that what we're doing is good and well, we have to be here. Uh, being a voice for you. And um, uh, I've learned a lot in my four years on the board. I've changed and I'm proud of the changes. I've developed um, as a human being uh, as a board of education member. And, uh, you know, life is a, a continuous journey, and this has definitely been one of learning about you all, about the needs of our community, and getting myself out of that comfort zone that I've been in for so very long. And uh, so I'm thankful to be here tonight to share my views with you. Thank you for having me. And like Dr. Myers has said, please, if everybody needs to vote, if education is number one to us, then we all need to vote. So thank you for being here, and I look forward to talking to you for Hello everyone, I'm Mark Gilboard. I'm the son of a lifelong special education teacher. I'm a Southeast Albuquerque <laughs> resident for 21 plus years. I'm just a dad. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is because uh, as a dad, I was at a PTA meeting uh, where my daughter goes to school uh, at Bandelier Elementary and uh, it was a great discussion about the uh, schools and the shape of our schools and uh, a teacher was brought to tears telling a story about uh, what what the schools are, are like and, and what's going on in the schools. And she, she said it was really just all about uh, what kind of experience we all want, want to have for our children in our schools. And it brought her to tears, and so that brought me to uh, to run for school board. Um, I just want Albuquerque to be uh, a great place to raise our children. I want what everyone else here wants. Um, I did used, used to be a, a, a classroom educator at, at CNM when it was called TBI. Um, I was a volleyball coach for a too short one year stint at Rio Grande High. Um, I'm vested in this process. I have a first grader and a soon to be middle schooler. And I wanted to be part of shaping the future of our schools. I feel I'm like a regular person, I'm a voice of reason. 
Um, yo soy un hombre sincero, uh, de pocas palabras en español, pero solo lo que quiero hacer es mejorar las escuelas y la calidad de vida um, para todos en este distrito. And I'm just here tonight to tell you that uh, it's a very important time for education and we need to do what's right by our children and our teachers. And I'm really happy to see so many interested people. And, um, and to echo everyone else, I vote on February 3rd and I hope to be able to represent the people in this district where Highland High School is. So thank you very much. I'm Barbara Peterson. I'm a teacher, a retired teacher of 35 years. I spent 30 years at Valle Vista, which is an elementary school in the South Valley. Um, Mark, as someone said earlier, there's no such thing as just a mom, just a dad. It's why we're all here. Um, one of the things that I found myself saying as I walked in tonight, I had a conversation that I cannot think of a more joyful thing to have done in 35 years of my life, that teaching was something that was creative and exciting and new and never boring. And I have to bite my tongue now when I talk to young people to con and make myself not say, don't do it. And I, can't, and I just think how tragic that is when you look at some of the policies that are causing those of us who are proud of our profession and, and have hesitation. In my years of teaching, I did everything from kindergarten to fifth grade. I was an instructional coach. I was a reading intervention teacher. The thing that made me most excited about teaching was a program called Reading Recovery. And the reason was that I learned so well how to look at the strengths of each child, to realize that the only way that you learn to take that next step is to be respected for what you know right now, and then how to build on it. And that took a lot of discussion with colleagues. It took a lot of time to think about what I was doing with students. And that's the kind of practice that we need for every teacher. And we need, just one more thing, being a parent gave me a whole new view of schools. And that's something else that we need those connections in this time. That's why I'm here. I was a shop teacher here in Albuquerque for 25 years, and I have to tell you not all the things were joyful. It's very hard to teach, and teachers are not getting enough support from the administrations. I think, based on my experience of teaching, I know better than most people how much more this system could be doing for the 90,000 our sons and daughters who are students in APS. Half of them are graduating without the skill set they need to lead happy and productive lives. And I'd like to change that. And I think the way to change it is to establish some real collaborative decision making in this district. We're talking about hiring a superintendent now who has all kinds of skill sets. And I don't care who they hire, they can't bring skill sets here that aren't already here. We need to start respecting the opinions and the experience and the expertise of interested stakeholders and find a way to pull them into the decision-making process so that we can make a difference. I write a blog called Diogenes 6. Uh, I've been writing about APS for a long time, caring about APS for a long time. If you'd like to go to the blog and have an opportunity there to comment on any of those. And you can also email me personally and I'll either respond to your email or write about it on my blog. I'd appreciate your attention. Buenas noches. Good evening, everybody. And I like to stand because I'm a teacher. And teachers stand and they, and they move around and they, that's just the way I was. And all you my ex-students out there, you know that's the way I am. I, I like to make sure that, I, that you stay awake. Anyway, um, I, I'm a 42-year educator. And I, I actually am not retired. I am retired from ABS, but I still teach online classes. Can you believe that? for one of our JCs here in New Mexico. Um, in fact, I just had to dismiss my class a while ago because I had to come over here, and they were very happy, of course, but, um, because I said, we're gonna have a very short class tonight. 
Um, you know, I, I'm a, I have a wonderful wife, and I have a, three wonderful sons, and, and five fantastic grandchildren. And um, they go to ATS, the grandchildren. And, um, and I, again, I've been with ATS for, for 40 years. Um, and rather than go any further, I just want to tell you what I believe in. I believe that every, every student can learn. And that we have to provide whatever is necessary so that they can use their abilities to learn. And that's what education is about. And so I truly believe that I believe strongly that teachers, teachers are at the forefront of that education. And we have to provide whatever we need to them to make sure that they get, they can perform that job and, and fulfill that job. I truly believe that a student needs to see themselves in the curriculum. They have to see themselves in the curriculum. And every student, every student has to be able to celebrate diversity and they should need to celebrate who they are. They need to be proud of who they are. They need to feel welcome for who they are. And nobody should ever feel like because of their last name or whatever that they're not who they are. And my time is up. All right. Thank you. Native Pacific Islander from Samoa. We live in the South Pacific. My mother is Dene and Atakapa Ishek and Samoan. My father is Afro Cuban. I was raised <clears throat> in Texas and Hawaii and Atlanta and Aotearoa, New Zealand and Samoa and New Mexico. So at age seven, we moved to Santa Fe or Santa Fe, and um, I realized that there were pinon nuts and that there were skies that looked like cotton candy. <coughs> so then we moved here, and from first grade, all the way up from 12th grade, I was an APS. I was a proud graduate um, and honors graduate. Is that enough? One more minute? Okay. And from there, um, I went on to study at a great college, at a university, Brown University, and I was able to do that because of the superintendent at the time, as well as my teachers. The superintendent at that time was Jack Barbara, and he listened to the mayor's student council, advisory council, and we told him that the New Mexico Association of Student Councils needed to have a student voice on APS, and we created an advisory council that exists to this day. Now, I believe that, per the advisement of Adrian Carter, I believe that there should be the creation of two student seats on the APS board. Voting or non-voting, we could determine, but one at the middle school level and one at the high school level. As a long-term member and activist for student councils, I believe that it is one of the most important ways that you can communicate and get involved early in the legislature. Uh, first thing I gotta say is that um, you know we have a we have a real problem in the APS is because we're so big. Now, being big can be also very advantageous. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. But one of the things that we need to do is, is in order to take care of our students is break it down. We gotta get, we gotta start this concept of community schooling. We have to get uh, to the point where, where they, the communities decide what is the curriculum Maybe even get involved in hiring the teachers for that community school. It, we got to get it to the point where we are having communities educate our children and not a huge uh, district that, um, you know, we have people that, in that uh, tower over there. That I don't know if they've even been at, at all the schools in, in our whole district. You know. But they, they, you know, do they even know who the principals are of all these schools? This is what I'm getting at. We need to break this down and, and get it a little bit uh, smaller. And the community schooling will do that. The community schooling will then involve families because when you start developing communities, 
That's when you start bringing families and families get involved. And when families get involved, that's when you start getting your best education. There's three stakeholders in this. There's the student, there's the education system, and then there's the families. And we want all three of them involved, and that's where the families come in. And I'll pass it on there. If you really want to engage stake and interest holders, the thing you do is give them a seat at the table where their decisions are being made that affect their interests. The Albuquerque School Board has a committee called the District and Community Relations Committee. There's no reason why that committee, committee could not have seats on it for community members. And no reason why District and Community Relations Committee meetings could not be roundtable discussions between interest in stakeholders and the leadership of the APS. There is already a precedent for community membership on school, uh, school board subcommittees, and that's the audit committee. There are two seats on that committee. They get filled by committee members, and they participate just like any other uh, uh, committee member does. The school board has a code of ethics. It's not enforceable, but the board ethics says that they are, are required to establish two-way communication between themselves and the community members they serve. They have not done that. There is no venue where you can just sit and discuss important issues openly and honestly. You have an opportunity to create that venue. Whatever your interest is, whatever you want to sit at the table, you have an opportunity for at least, a, at least once a month, for at least an hour, to actually sit at the table. <laughs> ask and answer questions. Find out what, what your proposal is, why it will work, why it won't. Uh, I would encourage you to, to fight for community member seats, not just for students, but any marginalized interest group in committee meetings with a decision-making role. Thank you. I think one of the strengths of all of the candidates up here is that we probably all agree that we, we need to find some structural ways of involving on a serious basis the community and students. But one of the things that I want to share is something that we did at Bayou Vista. Um, because of the specific needs of that community, which is about 95% um, for reduced lunch, with children with many issues for some of them at home. And probably about a third of the community is immigrant. We developed a dual language program. It was a 50 50 um, two way program so that whether students spoke English or Spanish is their primary language at home. We, we had the goal of having them leave in fifth grade as biliterate, bilingual students. And it was really inspirational. We had Title VII money. And with that Title VII money, we were able to have teachers take the time and have the resources to really think about how we would develop a program to meet students' needs. We had a family resource person that could really help bring people in. Because teachers, lots of times, despite their desire, are, their time is consumed. And, and so having that extra structural support was really helpful. We had extra education program. And so it's a sign of what, when there's a commitment structurally, we're able to find solutions. And finally, we've got to address early childhood education <coughs> in the state. There is money, there's resource, there's land grant permanent fund money that could be used to meet the needs of young children. And it's a political decision to not do that. And we need to join our voices so that we have a political voice to make it happen. So I have offered services in 77 Albuquerque public schools in addition to being a full-time teacher in APS. And I currently have students that are in APS that are here. And we conducted surveys over the past two weeks regarding this question because Fred provided it to us. And here are the top recommendations. So the best practices in family and community engagement 
are customarily best aligned to the specific community it's a serving. It was this serving. So the first step needs to be an assessment of the data there within that particular community to determine what services are needed. So that's step one. It's partnerships for change, listening to the voices of families. Um, family well-being is rooted in respect for culture, values, and home language, just as Ms. Peterson articulated. Second is policy creation around basic needs. Um, air, water, shelter, food. Poverty is addressed when the creation of programs aligns with the meeting of these primary needs. So at Ralph J. Lunch Academy, we had a program that basically provided two meals a day. These meals were definite for the children in that population, predominantly Native American, African American, and Latin. So every morning when they came to school, whether they were tired or if they had not had enough rest, they were assured that they would have a meal to eat and they were assured that they would have lunch. If necessary, the leftover food from those programs were disseminated throughout the community and the families that were there were able to take the leftover food to that, dispose of them and waste them. Number three, family and community partnerships for school readiness. So I advocate and support the Albuquerque Interface decision to create a mediation program where these people are responsible for intermediary interaction. So if you don't understand the language of a policy, if you don't know how to access your students' uh, grades, they will be here to help you with that. So I have five more, and you'll have to talk to me about the math of the form. <laughs> I want to say that um, the first step to these policies, um, as I see it, is uh, there has to be more social trust in schools. So between teachers trusting teachers, um, uh, between teachers and administrators, teachers and students, teachers and parents, administrators and parents and family members, the foundation, the building block for schools that improve, uh, in my opinion, is this mutual trust. And I think so we have this lack of trust at the beginning um, that needs to be overcome. I think that you create the space um, in these communities, uh, get community input, and we need to do things that foster the social trust in the schools. So specifically, um, there has to be professional development for cultural competency. Um, the school family relationships in the, in the more challenged um, districts, in the more challenged schools, um, they're shaped by teachers' assumptions sometimes of that parents aren't, um, they don't place a value on education. We hear a lot of this that, that I, we have to overcome these challenges of parents not placing a, a, a priority on education. I just don't think that's the case. I think that a lot of cultural competency training can go into professional development. And on the flip side, that there can be parent skill building. So programs that train parents on specific um, skills to support their children's progress and advocating for their children. When I've heard of these forums, um, last week and uh, today at Superintendent's Forum, is parents think they don't trust APS. They think other parents are getting to transfer their kids and the, the process is not transparent and that they don't understand. So I think there's parent skill uh, there as well and, and good, good ideas there. And lastly, involving all the great community organizations that are out there that are already doing great work. We're not doing enough to connect the great things that are happening and celebrate all the successes we have in our communities. When I moved here, it was the war zone. Now it's the international district. There are great things that are going on in this district. We need to use the schools and connect with the community organizations that are already doing things. So that's my plan for the call. First off, um, I'm having the opportunity to get yes for your family engagement policy, and that, that was a very uh, back and forth effort, to be sure, um, and uh, a lot of good dialogue between the people who comprise Family United for, United for Education and the Board of Education. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful, though, if we were able to divert the millions of dollars that we're currently spending on this on the on tests to the programs that really work? Anti-racism policies, <coughs> social equity, 
uh, we need to look at uh, a policy detailing alternatives, alternative options in lieu of suspension so we keep our kids in school. Um, we need to have social justice education in our schools. And we really need to work on partnerships, working together as a community, using all of the strengths that we have in our community to work together to meet the needs of all of our students. We have a diverse community that is rich in language and culture, and we need to utilize that and promote our children. Um, we also need to look at early childhood programs um, and make sure that we are indeed implementing the parent engagement policy by implementing the procedural directives that need to be completed with our families. Um, and, and finally, I think that if we are able to put these policies, policies into place that would support our students in our schools and we would see the, the impact it would make on our uh, achievement gap or opportunity gap. Thank you. APS is an awesome district. And I think we have begun a lot of work in a lot of different areas, but that's it. We've, we've gotten the work. Um, we have a parent engagement policy, but we don't have all the directives completed. Um, we need to look at anti-racism training. Um, we have been asking the board to participate in that so that everyone understands and is able to, to support the district in this training. Um, we also need to recognize that our, our parents are telling us what we need to do in our school. Some examples are that of, is a fabulous tool that was developed by our staff looking at walkthroughs and what does a welcoming school look like and giving our schools feedback. Um, I think cultural proficiency, we can go the process of of cultural proficiency, but we need to fully implement that. Um, we also need to ensure that we have equitable funding for all students, and we also need to develop a comprehensive list of strategies that can meet the needs of all of our students in partnership with the community agencies that want to work with us, the government, our universities, our social agencies, all of the community is willing, is willing to step up. And collective impact will certainly make that difference. Where APS uh, lags, uh, our children do shine. I've got to tell you, I, I'm in schools all the time, and children are so welcoming and empathetic with each other this day. I mean, even from when I was growing up. Um, you know, at Volcano Vista High School, their, their homecoming queen was a special needs young lady. And, um, you know, it was heartwarming, it's touching, because our children don't have those barriers. They just welcome everyone and anyone. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and it's taught me a lot having kids. They're teaching me to be both more open-minded. Um, but APS has a long way to go, no doubt about it. Um, me, me personally, as a parent, I think we need more customer service training in our schools. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been approached to help a parent who's been um, treated very rudely by staff and or a, a teacher or a principal or an administrator or somebody in Uptown. Um, so we need more customer service training, no doubt. Um, to the district's credit, I hate to say the credit, but we have to also walk in their shoes today. Our teachers are asked to do so much. And when it comes to human interactions with our, with our parents and with our students, we have less and less time for teachers to devote to that uh, because they are so overwhelmed with the mandates coming out from Santa Fe. It isn't an excuse, but it is something that we all have to consider that if we want more human interactions in our school and we want our schools to be more focused on our community needs, we really need to start making a lot more noise against what is coming out of Santa Fe so that we can do what we want to do in our schools, what we need for our children and our parents and our teachers, and stop 
being forced to do things that we know don't work. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, we mirror the community. So those of us aspiring to be on the board and the board and APS, we mirror the community. I think that our community is a um, is one that accepts difference, that is um, multicultural. I thank my lucky stars often that I live in New Mexico, that I live in Albuquerque <coughs> where it's celebrated as opposed to some other uh, places in, in our country. And, and I will tell you that my experience is uh, that there's a framework set up. APS has a framework. When you go to the website, there's a um, Office of Family and Community Engagement. There are administrative procedural directives. It sets out how to be welcoming, how to have welcome centers. Where it lacks is the implementation. Uh, as we said, there's no time, there's no money. Well, we need to mirror, they need, we need to, as board members, as aspiring board members, we need to mirror the community's desire to get that done. Um, they also have, uh, at UPS, a safe zone. It's through the nursing program, uh, through school nurses, that's safe for GLBT um, community. It's safe, it, it provides resources and, and websites and uh, resources for people that need, um, need some uh, intervention and need, need some, some help realizing that everybody is valued and that we celebrate diversity. So I'm thankful that those are set up. Now, um, more can be done to celebrate the differences but I think it's great that we do have the framework and we need to, in some ways, um, honor that and, and make it a priority for us to, to, to implement those things that have been set up. I can tell you there are places that we know that don't have frameworks, that don't honor and don't mirror the community. So that's to be celebrated as well. I think that celebrating diversity, from what I've seen in coaching and my kids' schools, that we, we do celebrate it and, and, and that we are on the road to, to making a, a difference and, and celebrating things. So that's how I feel about it. Yes. Okay, reality check. The framework of a vehicle without the engine to make it drive does not move the car. That's nice that the framework exists for equity, inclusion, and diversity, but it is not successful. My response is that APS does not successfully create a safe environment, and I'll tell you why. Um, last year, seven of my seventh graders were cutting themselves, and during testing, they attempted to commit suicide. Not my specific students, but the students within my particular school. Suicide rates among trans people of color within APS are up 68%. In 113 years, the APS School Board has never had an African American, Asian, or Pacific Islander sitting on the board. That is not a mirror of this community. This community is diverse, and a diverse, a diverse community deserves accurate representation. So a welcoming environment, on a positive tip, looks like posters on walls in multiple languages reflective of those who walk through the halls. Books with stories of collective experiences from a vast array of people from throughout the planet, authored by a vast, diverse perspective of authors. It looks like bathrooms with icons that include unisex symbols. It looks like training on how it is inequitable to take someone's agency or to silence them. It looks like APS officers protecting students from injustice and harm, not criminalizing, not prejudging, and not and so assuming that they should be put in a prison pipeline. Okay, school is not supposed to end up in prison, but check the statistics and you will find that Latino and African American students in APS inequitably have a huge disparity regarding their matriculation in APS. A safe, equitable environment in APS would look like the absence of fear. It looks like testing that's not administered unilaterally to all students without regard for their individuated special needs the absence of racial microaggressions. APS needs to be on our side, and that means creating safety, inclusion, diversity, and equity, for real. That is exactly the mission of public schools, and that's why I've worked hard to make public schools work for many years, and I think the only way that we're gonna make this happen is if everyone really and truly is committed to not only voicing once, but maintaining their voice in what happens in schools. You know, I think truly everyone who walks through the doors of schools has somewhere that intention. And one of the things that I've seen is testing and punitive policies have just become the 
the overwhelming mandate of schools is that schools have turned into pressure cookers. The teachers find themselves less able to take time to use the materials that address particular needs of kids. The teachers are in this position of test, test, and test, and prep more for testing. And it has done a huge disservice to our community. There are some other things that I think can lay the basis for real change, and that is in the community schools. The community schools that are growing and developing really and truly are figuring out how to open the door to the community to meet real needs and also make the school a place where it's safe, where people can start to be engaged by bringing in resources, mental health resources, um, health care resources, dental care, all of those things go together that start to be a bridge for the community into the school. And I think that it's something, it's a strength that we really can build on. It started, I think there's some things we can be really proud of. And by putting additional resources, by looking at how we grow that, I think we can really change the climate of schools so long as we don't give up. APS does not create a self-cussing and well-being environment for people who are different. Uh, there are a lot of people who absolutely feel unsafe, unwelcome, and unsupported in the school. And the question is why still? Is this really a problem that will not be solved at all, or have we not try to solve it in the best way? The best way to solve any problem is to get together the people who are affected by that Discussions need to be roundtable discussions. Roundtables are where the group agrees what they're going to discuss and debate, and then they all participate equally in that decision. And those kinds of decisions are going to lead to fixes that we want. What bothers me about all the process that all these minority groups use is that they feel like if they can form enough coalitions with other minority groups that can really be powerful enough that the board has to, has to listen to them. And it's not ever going to happen. The teacher union is as powerful a group as it is, and they don't have to see the particular decisions made. It gives just about the five-year academic plan and teachers were not on the table and how it helps. The model is flawed. That we accept the seven board members, the superintendent, and so forth, know how to solve our problems. We have the expertise, dedication, hearing, everything we need to solve problems, except the power to make decisions and spend resources. And that needs to change. The power and the resources they're spending belong to you. You need to take charge and the decision maker about how the power is fielded and the resources spent. Yeah, the answer is absolutely no. Okay. We are definitely a school district that is very, very ill when it comes to racism and the treatment of our students. I'm, I'm very sorry to say that. I don't, it, it's, it's sad. Coming from the state of New Mexico, which has a history of, of diversity, and yet we cannot accept our students for what they are, and it's very sad. But how do I know this? I know it's because my students have told me so. I've had many students come with tears in their eyes because of something a teacher told them, or a principal told them, or another student told them about who they are. How do I know this? So we had a forum last June, and, and two of our school board members were there, and they know that as a result of that forum, we decided that, that APS has a problem. And it has to be solved. It has to be solved. And I guarantee you, if I get on the board, that's going to be a, a major priority. One other reason why I know this is so, look at the achievement gap. Are you telling me that the achievement gap is that big because our minority students are not smart enough 
they can't achieve like the other ones? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I'm sorry, that's not so. They're just as intelligent, they can learn just as much as everybody else. But unfortunately, many of them are turned off by the way that they are treated. Many of them are turned up, many of them turn away from what they could accomplish because of the way they're treated. I'm sorry, but but I, mean, I don't want to be a bearer of bad news here. But it's it's there. And we better all wake up and realize that and uh, if I get on, that's priority. Thank you. answered it, but I'll, I'll go a little bit further, and I will say that, um, and I mentioned it at the very beginning, we cannot keep our students, if we, they do not see themselves in the curriculum, and we cannot keep our students if they don't feel welcome in the classroom, and so the graduation rates are going to continue to, they're not going to go up very much if we can't solve those two problems. We gotta cut that gen that uh, that um, achievement gap, and we have to work on making our students feel welcome in the classroom. I, I, I you know I, I I go back to what I said earlier about community schooling is the answer. When you get community schooling, then the community makes the decisions about all, all of these things. I can't imagine a teacher saying you people in a community school. I just can't imagine because I know that they got the whole community on them now when they make a statement like that. Because I've heard that so many times. You people do this, you people do that. Uh, in this classroom, we speak only English. In a community school, that wouldn't happen. That would not happen. And that's why we need to start looking at this whole concept of community school. And, and that, would, that would definitely, I promise you, that would increase our graduation rates. And I've cut that achievement gap. I would like to stop talking about group achievement gaps and, and disparities in graduation rates. In the first place, we need to stop talking about graduation rates. There are a number of ways to measure the effectiveness of public schools, and graduation rates are the least reliable. They're the only one that's growing while every other measure stays flat or declines. It's not about graduation rate, and it's not about the achievement of groups of kids. It's about one kid at a time, and the gap between the, where that kid is and where that kid could be if they were getting the help they need. If we close all the individual gaps, the group gaps close by themselves. We need to change our focus from having kids do things in unison to gain individual attention to kids. We have to meet them where they are, identify their individual problems, whether they share with 2,000 <coughs> kids, and then figure out whatever it is we can do to eliminate that obstacle for that kid. It seems like there are two parts of this. And one is something that we have control over inside of the schools, and I think people have spoken to it very eloquently, making sure that we meet the instructional needs from preschool all the way to 12th grade, making sure that we have curriculum that reflects the needs of the community and builds on a vision of the world from that. Um, there are many things that we can do inside of schools with, with the kinds of support. But one of the things that I think we've sort of danced around is the role of poverty. And the role that, yes, all of these other factors play a, a huge role, but there is a huge opportunity gap for a child reading the difference between a child that's been on an airplane, been to Washington, D.C., walked around <laughs> the White House, seen the Smithsonian, and then comes back and reads about it, is totally different from the experience of a child who has never been on an escalator by the time they're in second grade. It's an opportunity gap, and we have got to start addressing that. Um, we 
we will work and work and work. And we might work better together or we might find more discord. But until we address the poverty in our communities, and that means looking beyond what's happening with minimum wage. What role can we play as a school board and as a community saying, we need living wages. We have got to reach out and do not just inside of the school. I am totally willing to take the responsibility instructionally for what I need to do with my students to meet their needs, but I'm not satisfied with that. And I hope that we can work together to really have a vision for where this community can go and should go. So first and foremost, we need to address safety because safety is at the root of inclusion. And although we're talking about the disparity in graduation rates, <laughs> we have to understand that holistic safety is much different from temporal safety. So to be safe environmentally, metaphysically, with regard to language, without regard to your gender, identity, status, nationality, race, place of origin. This is an equalizing factor to establish a safe space for the to learn. Some things that we can do in order to address directly the graduation rate would be to require anti-racism training, people first language training, Nonviolent communication training, LGBTIQQ and holistic safe, train, safe space training for all teachers, administrators, employees, parents, and students. Um, for the authentic embrace of diversity, time. The authentic embrace of diversity, of diversity, we need to stand behind our commitment and not just walk around throwing the word. So you have that chance to take that step today. Um, you can call for a rise. You can rise up yourself. You can call for a revision, inclusion, sustainability, and equity within this system. Because the disparities are resulting from a systemic disenfranchisement, which means we don't have a vote. And we don't have a vote because we don't have a seat. And we don't have a seat because when you walk into the building at APS and look on the wall at the superintendent, you see a homogenous portrait filled with one race and one gender. I'm gonna go ahead and be in the minority for a second. White guy that I am. Um, and I do want to say that we have to realize too that since. In 2008, um, the graduation rates were 10 points lower than they are now. Now, I don't know if the rigged the system to make it 10 points higher, and that goes maybe to the trust and transparency that some of us feel is lacking. But when you live in a community where right now, 2013 was 10 points higher than 2008, something good has to be going on. We need to look at the data, celebrate what's working, work on that, and, and, and make it a priority. Our priorities are in the wrong place, and we need to let people know that there's improvement, and we can build on that improvement, and we aren't even close to, be, to being finished with the improvement, and there's no reason that English language learners need to be almost 20 points lower in graduation rates than, uh, than the highest graduation rate. So I do have some ideas, I think, we all agree that early intervention is the key, that there's a, it's a problem of poverty, that things like breakfast in the schools are the right approach, that um, <coughs> programs that address readiness. We have kindergartens in our district, uh, District 4, where 20 kids come to school and they've had hundreds of books in their house. And we have 10 kids in that same kindergarten class that have never had a book in their hands. Um, and that something needs to be done to address that readiness issue. And it's an issue of poverty and equality. So I'm in favor of more universal pre-K instead of just voluntary. I think that Head Start-led programs, which are doing great work, can be expanded. And if we didn't spend so much money and time on other things and make these a priority, this early intervention and the readiness, that 
uh, with our community engagement and the community schooling that we can get the gap uh, to disappear and that we are getting the gap to disappear already. We're working towards it. We've, in the district, taken many steps to close what I call now the poverty learning gap. I absolutely do not believe that just because you're a child of color you may not learn or you cannot learn. I absolutely do believe that poverty plays a key role in our community and in our state and in our schools. So if you don't address poverty, then you're not addressing academics. And unfortunately, we have state leadership that thinks that it's all about a test. When, in fact, they ignore the fact that it's about poverty and uh, social ills that we need to uh, work together on as a community and as a district to address. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of APS. I, I love APS. I, I'm an advocate of public schools. We've done a lot to try and close the um, poverty gap and increase graduation rates, but graduation rates, again, is a number. Um, we have so many alternative programs and we need to do more. One thing that we're not doing enough of, we've done so well um, coming up with college prep programs for our students, but I still don't see any vocational programs or they're limited to just a few students who can get themselves there. And that's not right. You know, we need to really look at what we're doing vocational-wise. Because I'll tell you what, my, my, my brother is not a college graduate, but he is a successful contribu contributor to our society. And uh, what are we doing to our children when we, when the emphasis is always on college? What about careers that can make kids succeed and, uh, and, and be contributing members of society? So we have a lot of work to do in APS, no doubt about it. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements. We're trying to address all the needs of everybody in the community. It's not an easy job. And uh, as far as being a board member and a future board member, I hope, uh, it is always at the forefront of our efforts, is what else can we do to meet the needs of each and every child? Thank you. That is one, well, the greatest uh, responsibility that we have. And what I would like to see in our superintendent is the superintendent who understands our community, the diversity in our community, the population that we serve. And I would like to see that our superintendent values the input of our community, our parents, all of our stakeholders, um, I would like someone who is an instructional leader as well as a strong advocate for our employees. Um, the ability to collaborate with our, all of our stakeholders, including our parents, our community, our government, our agencies, nonprofits, uh, mental health services. Able to really have excellent communication skills in bringing people together and working on solutions. Um, I want someone who has the ability to understand what the needs of our students are uh, and be able to come up with uh, the best practices around the country to meet those needs. I want someone dedicated to high quality instructional practices, uh, be able to gain the confidence of our community, improve the teacher morale and support our teachers both with these resources as well as professional development. Uh, approachable, an excellent li listener, and I really want our superintendent to be out in the community, to go into the schools, to go into our offices, to talk to our people in our community. Um, I also want a problem-solving uh, individual who is able to sit at the table and address the issues in a dialogue fashion rather than listening and then going off on their own tangent. Uh, I think the implementation of finally addressing cultural proficiency is something that I will also look at uh, and also equity within our uh, public school system. Uh, for me personally, I'm going to have my reformer radar on 
and I say reformer radar because I'm going to be making sure that um, I'm not going to be endorsing any body who comes into this district and thinks that scoring our schools and our teachers and our students uh, based on test scores is the right way to go. So that is number two. I'm hoping for somebody local, somebody who knows. In and doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you have served as a superintendent before, but somebody who has the vision and the capacity to look at what we're doing right and improve on those uh, programs and the ability to really dissect what we're not doing so well or programs that are wasting our, our time, our finances, and uh, our, 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 our money. So I'm looking for somebody who is also empathetic uh, to the teachers in the field, and frankly, I'm getting tired as a board member and as a parent of four children who are, are I call it, terrorized by these high stakes tests. Um, I'm frankly tired of the talk about looking for somebody who can collaborate with the business community, because until the business community starts acknowledging that these tests don't work for our students and for our teachers, then frankly, I don't care about a superintendent who can collaborate with the business communities. I want a superintendent who will listen to uh, the parents who have been going to board meetings since April telling our board and our superintendent that we are tired of these tests and we want something done to stop it. That's what I'm looking for. I first want to say that um, I did fill out the survey that's online and um, we all want to have a voice. I'm no different than anyone else in this room in my desires to choose the qualities of the superintendent. I encourage everyone to go to the ABS website and put what they want. Um, and you're not just limited to the 10 of the 35 qualities they want you to pick from. There's a giant box that I encourage everyone to fill with whatever you want in a superintendent. So I'm no different than anyone else. But what I put and what I think is important is that somebody that is already demonstrating uh, an acumen and a skill in diverse communities and multiculturalism, not something that says I need to spend a year or two really getting to know my community. They should already know enough about how to um, function in an urban environment, in a poor environment, in a one that celebrates diversity, and I'd like to see that. I want somebody that has worked with historically low graduation rates and has a strategy for improving them. I want uh, um, alternatives to high stakes testing and any sort of thoughtful common core implementation is here. Uh, it has a few good points, it has a lot of work, but let's get somebody that's going to implement it in a smart way. Um, I want personality traits. I think we did a good job of hiring somebody that achieved a lot last time. Now we need somebody and focus on the personality traits. Humility, uh, leadership traits. The desire to be here, to be stable for Albuquerque, um, to learn and grow. Uh, somebody that is not doesn't know everything, but can learn and grow. And hopefully somebody that has classroom experience. Um, even if it's in the too far gone past, somebody with an empathy and passion for teaching and teachers. That's how we'll get a good leader here for Albuquerque Public Schools. So how I feel about this issue and have answered on both questionnaires is that I think it's really important that the board member speaks with the constituents, which is you, and all of the members in the district in order to determine what characteristics and qualities are most important. So it really doesn't matter what I think, because my responsibility is to find out what you think and then take that information back and represent you accurately. So personally, I have a little bit of opinion, and um, the qualities that I would like are after we meet with all 194 schools in a meeting to determine what their important characteristics are, I would like someone with real life experience. So I teach break dancing because I'm a beat, and I teach iambic pentameter because I can drop a rhyme. I don't operate purely in theory or rhetoric. Rhetoric I get in the game. Um, I've read the manual, but I like to teach without it. I teach the strength of the child, and I think that the superintendent should lead to the strength of the district. Um, it should be someone who fosters trust, someone who is from this community, is familiar with this community, likes to in Chile, and likes to talk to people that live here. Someone like John Lopez. He'd be a 
great superintendent. <laughs> uh, I want someone who's the same man or woman in the boardroom that he is or she is on the playground. And I am with board member Port. I think we should buy local, hire local. We do need a re-evolution and we need it from someone who innately understands New Mexico's intimate needs and does not hold a predetermined agenda and is not committed to any business entities. Probably our greatest unity is the candidates sitting up here so are bringing them about what we need to see in a superintendent. Um, one thing that I need to add as well as the, the respect and seeing the strength of the diverse community, the strength of having multiple languages and cultures, and all, and the amazing the community that we have in Albuquerque, the need as people who work in schools to have someone who understands teaching and learning, how complex the job of teaching is, and who understands the importance of the collective bargaining with employees as ways of solving problems and moving the district forward. But the bottom line on top of all of that is someone who is committed to the public part of public school, who is not seeing this as a way of cashing in our, on kids, of diverting money into programs that don't benefit us or our students, and of making sure that that underlying commitment is to our public school system and can see it as actually a system of schools. See, each school is a different place. Know that within the public system, we need to offer what students and communities need and can be a believer in that. Finally, just listening, and I, I think the point that our role as a board can't be to micromanage. It has to be whoever is sitting on that board to make the wisest and best decision. And then to make sure that the board stays in touch, that whoever it is of us who's doing that, keep that ongoing discussion, conversation, connection with our communities, with all of us together, to hold the superintendent accountable to our decisions. Beside me first said that there's no one of us as smart as all of us, and there's no superintendent we can hire who knows more than all of us about anything. There is no magic, there are no magicians. What we, we don't need somebody here to come in here and tell us what to do. The teachers of the APS right now have between them a hundred thousand years of teaching experience. They have all the good ideas and perfect solutions that we can ever use. The problem is, is nobody ever asked them about them. They have no seat at the table where decisions are made. Rather than finding a superintendent with specific qualities, I would look for a superintendent who's ready, willing, and able to support real collaborative decision making. Decision making that brings to the table all the knowledge and experience that interested stakeholders have in abundance. We need somebody who can create synergies among those of us who have exceptional knowledge, experience, and dedication. We need a superintendent who's willing to support collaborative decision making by delegating real decision making power to the school level and to, and to delegate resources spending to the school level. All of the input you're going to be asked for in the superintendent doesn't mean a thing. You're never, in this whole process, going to make any kind of decision. The needle is not going to move. School board members know who they want to hire, and they're not going to hire somebody else unless you come up with something they've never heard of before and are willing to go along with. The decision-making model needs to be changed. We need something that will lead us in a different direction. Respeto, respect, that's the answer. We need a person to come in here that's going to respect everybody. Everybody who they are, respect the history of this state, and somebody that's going to 
respect all the stakeholders. We're talking parents, definitely teachers, because I, I think there's a lot of disrespect out there for teachers. Um, and, 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 and then we need somebody that's going to, you see, there's some, there's some decision making that we have no control over. A school board doesn't have any control over it. Um, it's coming from upstairs. It's coming from all the way from Washington. So we need a superintendent that knows how to get the message of this district to those people. I used that word, didn't I? Those people. <laughs> but we need to get the, the message. The media superintendent is going to get that message that we, that this high state testing is just something that's going to, it's just going to break us all. And all it is is corporate America trying to make some money, trying to get their, their paws into public education and maybe do away with public education. But we need a superintendent who realizes all of it and, and who, who will stop that at that level because we, people on the board, we don't have any control over that. There's some things we have no control over. So, um, but if, they, if we have somebody come in with respect, respect for everybody, listen, somebody that's listened, somebody that's approachable, somebody that's visible. There's no reason why right now our superintendent should be here tonight. That's what I think. Yeah, this is right. very important. To me, it's a very important event. That's just what I think. And, uh, and I think that it's, in some kind of event like this, superintendent should be here, or a designate. Somebody's going to take notes for you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Thank you. Sí, cómo no. I respectfully decline to answer a yes or no question. Yes. I'm a mama bear. 
I've met so many kids in our community who are just like my kids, have so many uh, qualities that are not being addressed. Um, I do get emotional because I don't like the direction our public schools are taking in New Mexico and nationwide. I think you all need to be very aware that the high stakes testing and the associated grading of our schools and teachers is the greatest racial discriminatory act against our society since before the civil rights movement. I fear a world in America where the haves take their kids out of public schools that, are, that everybody's told are failing and the have-nots are left in our public schools. That is not the America I want for my children. It's not the America I want for my future grandchildren. And so, for you all and the work that you're doing, I really, all of us who agree, need to stand together, work together, fight together. I say fight, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty vicious about this. I'm angry. And uh, we need to take back control of our schools, back into our communities, back into our teachers' hands, back to where the focus is on our children and not on the money, the millions of dollars that are being made by already rich people. That's what we need to do. And uh, I hope that you'll, you'll also note that my opponent isn't up here tonight. Thank you, Ms. Clark. to ask. Thank you. I want to be a voice of positivity. I want to advocate for parents and students and teachers, administrators and staff, employees of APS. I don't want to APS bash my way to the top. I want to make, uh, I want to just be sincere uh, in my desire to help make this a great place to raise all kids, uh, great and happier family. All families should be welcomed in APS. And to see, I want to see, I want the board and I want APS and the superintendent to see issues of achievement as issues of honoring diversity, and of issues of achievement as issues of social equality, and issues of achievement as an issue of poverty. I want to help uh, the school board and APS make the right decisions that honor all points of view. Uh, when you serve the underserved, everyone rises. When you serve those most in need. Um, and I want to take the time to celebrate the people here up on stage. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, put, putting ourselves out there, all these people put themselves out there. Uh, we all care deeply for our community. I want to personally thank each and every person that's up here. Um, I want to thank Families United for education. Only through forums like this um, can we truly see what our community is looking for. That's why we're here. Um, without the space that you all create, and I'm not talking about the physical space, I'm talking about the space for discussion that you create, um, we would never be able to fill it with our passion and our ideas. And, and, and our ability to, to get everyone at a seat at the table and to rise the whole, when, when the, I'm not getting my metaphor right, but when you, a rising tide raises all boats, and, and that's what I want to do if I'm lucky enough to be elected and to represent district for this district and on the APS school board. So thank you all. In order to serve the best, to the best of my ability, with my heart, mind, and soul, in word and deed, the students, teachers, parents, staff, service providers, administrators, and my fellow board members, I would like to engage on your behalf in the diligent work to create, develop, and implement measures to ensure employee and estate high quality, free, equitable, inclusive, diverse, holistic, Public education for all students, regardless of race, creed, ability, religion, nationality, status, gender, class, orientation, or identification. In a holistically safe space, in a structurally sound building, with adequate materials and well-qualified, compassionate, critically conscious, culturally competent educators of integrity as their teachers, advocates, and co-learners. That is what I'd like to do. And I need your help in order to do that. But aside from asking for your vote, I want to quickly thank the organization of which I am a part, Families United for Education, my husband, my partners in crime, my children, each of you for being here, my fellow board member candidates, and also the head class over there, running it. Um, we do need to rise. And by rising, we need to restore integrity, safety, and equity to this school system. The only way
way to do that is to embrace the diversity, protect it, and advocate it by instituting policies that create inclusive education for all of us. That does not exist right now. And articulating that is not a negative aspect, it's just a realism that we have to face. You have to identify the problem in order to properly address it. So, if we truly believe in equity, diversity, inclusion, and advocacy, we need everyone to have a seat at the table. And Thank you, Ms. Aurelia. I truly think public education is at a crossroads. I mean, public education has been hard fought for through the labor movement and all of the anti-child labor struggles of a hundred years ago. The civil rights movement, I think we've all seen that public education is what should be the quarter, cornerstone of the democracy. And what's horrifying is to see how it is under attack that the high stakes tests are one of the ways that that's being waged, undermining confidence, withdrawing resources, cutting public schools off at the knees, and then condemning public schools for not running fast enough. And so my commitment, my commitment is to bring to the board what I've learned with all of my experience in the classroom, to know how precious that relationship between a teacher and a child, between the other adults in the school, the EAs, the custodians, all the human beings that pull together with families to try to make things work, no matter what is falling apart around them. And that's what I really intend to bring to the board. We can't give up. Just like when we raise families, we don't tell children once to do something and figure that they'll go forward and do what we tell them to do. Well, our relationship all together around public education needs to be the same way. It's an ongoing dialogue. We can't do it once. We've got to do it in the long term. And just one final thing that's, I'm proud to have been a member of the Teachers Federation all these years, not just because we call you the but because it's been a vehicle to fight for public schools. It's been a voice, and we need to do that together. Thank you. Take just a moment to explain my reticence to answer yes or no to the last question, is that because I think I have a better idea, that is that the training need to attend would be better delivered from your seat at a district and community relations If you have to ask permission to sit at the table, you don't have a seat at the table. You need to ask any of us before you vote for us if they're willing to fight for you for a seat, a community seat at the district and community relations committee. Any answer except yes means no. Do you want somebody to continue making the decisions for you, or do you want to be part of the decision-making process? If you do, you're going to have to let somebody lead that fight, and then you're not going to be able to sit back and watch. You're going to have to follow them into the fight. You're going to have to go to public forums and insist on your right to participate meaningfully in decision-making that affects your interests. The NPS budget just came out. <coughs> of the state's budget. The power and resources belong to you. It's up to you to decide how to spend it. And I would caution you against trying to let somebody who is going to spend with good intentions. People who uh, want to govern with good intentions don't intend to govern. You need a seat at the table. And you can have a fight for it if you want it. It's not there are board members who do not want to engage in open and honest public discussion that they can't control the direction of. If you want to engage in those discussions, you need to insist that they take place. The round table discussions in board committees. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to start by thanking Claire for putting this on.
done tonight this is outstanding this is an excellent way for voters to know how candidates stand and what they stand for and i appreciate that i um, i, I want to just end the same way i started and just tell you that if i'm elected to this position and, and i'm running for district four then i'll always have that priority students teachers Students first, and everything and anything I do, or as a board member, will be with that. Those wonderful students that are sitting out there in the, in the, in the classrooms, trying to try to get an education and trying to make themselves a better person and to become productive citizens of the community. And so, uh, every decision, every vote, well, they will be in my mind. And then teachers who are the forefront and the ones that are, are the, the true soldiers out there that are getting the, the, the deeds that are done. Those are the people we need to keep in mind. We need to treat them with respect. We need to pay them well. We need to give them all the things, all the resources they need. And so knowing that, I would be so, so much a guardian of the, of the pocketbook. I cannot see any money going anywhere else but down to the student. It's got to get to the student. However we best can do that, we got to get the money to the student. And I would be a guardian of that budget if I, if I get on this position. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to end by saying I believe in students, I believe in teachers, I believe in diversity, and it's something we should be celebrating. And I, I um, hope that my 42 years of experience as a teacher would um, if, if I'm elected, would make me do a very good job as a board member. Ladies and gentlemen, three positions, that's a lot of votes on the board. Hopefully people will get out and vote. Thank you.